All right. Happy Thursday night, everybody. Welcome to the Penny Pack Ecological Restoration Trust Program. Um, we're happy to have you tonight. We have members from uh, Penny Pack Trust, Wissahickon Trails, Tokeny Tacony Frankfurt Watershed Partnership, Lower American Conservancy, um, all joining us tonight. So thank you all from all the watersheds um, and caring for you know, your specific watershed. My name is Kevin Roth. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Penny Pack Ecological Restoration Trust. If you don't know who we are, we are an 850-acre um, privately owned nature preserve in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Uh, we have just over 1,200 members supporting us. Um, so with all that being said, we, um, we're privately owned, but we allow the, the, the members of the public to use our trails um, as a trust kind of thing. But then we have 1,200 members of the community supporting us and allowing us to be who we are. Um, so thank you members tonight. If you're not a member of ours or um, have never donated, um, please consider at least giving a $5 donation for the program tonight. Um, it, it all goes a long way and supports us doing programs just like tonight. Um, so thank you members. Thank you for joining us from the Penny Pack Trust. Um, so just some housekeeping about Zoom. Uh, we have our two presenters tonight and if you could just please um, keep your video off and um, stay muted for us tonight just to keep the program going. Uh, each of our presenters will take questions after they're done presenting and at the very end if you come up with any last last minute questions. But as they're presenting, if you could just add the, um, your, your questions to the chat so you don't forget about them and then we can go through them you know, pretty quickly after they're done speaking. Um, so I think I've covered all of the housekeeping part of Zoom. Uh, I, I believe head nods there. Yeah, I think I covered all that. Still letting a couple more people in. Um, while I let everyone else in, I'd like to welcome our speakers tonight. Um, this program will be presented by Dr. Karen Poe, uh, who is a, a postdoctoral scholar in veterinary entomo entomology laboratory at Penn State University. Uh, I practiced that several times today and it didn't come out as planned, um, but she has a lot of experience. Uh, she's done great presentations like this before and she comes well recommended from some of our members. So thank you, Dr. Karen Poe. We appreciate you being here tonight. And we also have Bill Moore, Moore Bill, who who is a board member of the PA Lyme Resource Net Network and leader of the Pittsburgh Lyme Disease Support Group. Um, so they're, they're also both taking their time and volunteering with us tonight to give us this information. Um, they've done this program before and it comes well recommended. We're very happy to have both of them tonight. Um, so like I said, um, please keep your questions in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Karen Poe will present first. Um, and she's also going to answer questions when she's done speaking. So um, without any uh, more of me talking, I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Poe. Great. Thank you, uh, Kevin. I really appreciate that introduction. Uh, so let me go ahead and try and share my screen. Do you mind giving me capability to share my screen? Okay, there we go. Yeah, I could actually. Okay, so do you guys see the slide? I have two screens, so it's really hard to tell sometimes. Right? Okay, awesome. So now I have my face in the way of my in the way of my screen. So that's great. Awesome. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, like Kevin said, I'm Karen Poe. I'm currently a postdoc at Penn State University, and I really want to thank you guys for coming out to join us this evening for just a really fun talk about ticks. I know some people might not think it's very fun to have ticks on you or to talk about ticks, but um, I may be a little biased because I do research some. Okay, so uh, this is a really well-timed talk, I will say, uh, because it's really warm outside now and ticks are probably out and about already. So we have to make sure that uh, we can protect ourselves from ticks um, as you start to go out and do more outdoorsy things. Um, so I'm really excited to be here tonight, especially uh, with Bill, uh, because we provide really nice complimentary uh, information on ticks and Lyme disease. So I'm mostly go over uh, some biology of ticks and then uh, move on to some tick prevention methods for, um, for the personal level as well as the landscape level. So up until recently, and by recently, I mean like with all things COVID, uh, up until then, we 
been hearing, we had actually been hearing a lot of news about ticks and tick-borne diseases. I honestly couldn't go past um, a day or a headline without seeing something about ticks and tick-borne diseases. And this is with pretty good reason. Uh, tick bite rates have been increasing. Uh, we're constantly seeing the spread of ticks to different regions of the country. And not only are some of these ticks invasive and the populations are increasing and spreading, but we also have native ticks that are here um, that have always been here. And they're also increasing in their population levels. And so with that said, we really need to keep an eye out for these invasive and these new species while still keeping track of the ticks that we already have here. And just as tick bite rate is increasing, so is the number of tick-borne disease cases throughout the United States. Between 2004 and 2017, we see that three times more cases have been reported in terms of tick-borne diseases. Even between uh, 2016 and 2017, we see an increase of about 10,000 more cases reported in 2017 uh, for tick-borne diseases. So that's why it's really important to be able to protect yourself when you're outdoors, whether it's for recreational or occupational reasons. And so we'll go through the biology of ticks and how we use the biology of ticks to control them and to prevent yourself from getting bitten by ticks and the diseases that they carry. So over the past several decades or so, we've seen a really huge increase in the number of ticks, meaning we've probably been encountering ticks way more often now uh, because ticks, they're pretty much everywhere. That's pretty much the first point that I wanna make on the slide and really throughout the rest of these slides. Ticks are everywhere. <laughs> Seems like we just can't get away from them. So there are also uh, many different tick species that are out there and control of these ticks, as well as the tick-borne disease risk that are associated with each of these ticks, that will change depending on the species that are commonly found in your area due to their different behaviors. Here in Pennsylvania, we have about 20 different species of ticks, but the ones on the screen, these three right here, the big three I like to call them, these are probably the most common ticks that you will come across and they are mostly found in the Eastern United States. So the most common one that you'll probably come across is the black legged tick and its scientific name is Ixodes scapularis. And so this is probably the one that you've encountered the most and uh, it's also the most common one. And it also transmits the bacterium that causes uh, Lyme disease. And this is the only tick um, that we know of so far that, uh, that can transmit the pathogen, the germs that cause uh, Lyme disease. So just like the name suggests, uh, the black legged tick has, has black legs, uh, but it also has an orange and a dark brown back. Uh, but we can also find the American dog tick. Now this one's uh, relatively large. Um, it's pretty easy to, to see as an adult. This one has really pretty white decorations on uh, the back. And then we also have the Lone Star tick. Now this one's a new, kind of a newcomer to the, to the state. So this is mostly confined to the Southern region of Pennsylvania. We haven't really seen these in central Pennsylvania, which is where, I, where I'm currently broadcasting from. Uh, so in our surveillance, we haven't really seen these, but we know that they're probably making their way uh, throughout Pennsylvania. So lone star ticks, um, just like the name suggests, it has a lone star, or in this case, just a lone white dot on, on the female's back. So those are the common ones that we'll find in Pennsylvania and the Eastern United States, but there are other species that can be found pretty much all over North America, and that includes the brown dog tick. Uh, but then we also have other ticks that are more so confined to certain regions. And this includes the Gulf Coast tick, um, mostly found in the Gulf Coast. Uh, we also find the Rocky Mountain wood tick, and that's mostly in the, uh, the Rocky Mountains. And so as you can probably tell there's a pattern here. We're not exactly super creative as scientists when it comes to naming things. We like to name things based on their appearance. So like the black legged tick, for example, um, and also based on where uh, these ticks are found. So before we jump into uh, some tick biology, let's uh, quickly learn about the size of a tick. So if you guys have ever seen a tick, um, you might be able to answer this one. Uh, but if you haven't, what do you think the approximate size of a black-legged or it's also known as a deer tick? Uh, so your options are, they're about a microscopic size, they're about the size of a seed, a dime, a quarter, or a banana. So go ahead and type in the chat real quick to let us know what, what your answer is. So I'll give you about 10 seconds. All right, so I'm seeing a lot of participation. You got like 10 seconds left. I'll give you like 10 seconds. I'm really bad with time and estimating time. So it could actually be in real life, 30 seconds. All right, so it looks like most people are saying B. I see a couple Cs as well. Oh, they meant B. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so if you said that uh, ticks are about the size of a seed, you would be correct. So adult ticks are about the size of a sesame seed, while the nymphal ticks, which is the life stage that comes before the adult stage, so they're kind of like the rebellious teenage uh, tick, and we'll talk, about the we'll talk about the life stages in the next slide. Uh, so the nymphal ticks are about the size of a poppy seed. 
And so this can be really shocking to think about, but it's a really great reminder of just how small these ticks can be. So if you look in this figure on the screen, uh, you'll see just a nice normal uh, poppy seed muffin. Um, but if you actually zoom in closer, you see that some of these seeds have legs poking out of them. So they're not seeds at all. They're actually nymphal ticks. So I just want you to remember how small these ticks can be and how easy it is to miss them on your body. So make sure to check closely when you do your tick checks and I'll tell you how to do that um, in a few slides. All right, so just wanna let you know, there are no ticks on poppy seed muffins. The CDC put this on social media and people took it the wrong way. The CDC are not putting ticks in your muffins. So enjoy your poppy seed muffins and your poppy seed bagels, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, when we think about the ticks uh, life cycle, so let's just remember the common rule of two, three, and four. So those ticks that I talked about in that first slide, those big three ticks, um, they will generally follow the two, three, four rule. So these ticks will have a two-year life cycle. They will feed on three hosts and they go through four different life stages. So, um, so let's start with the eggs, this egg stage. So that's our first stage and we're in the first year. So the eggs will hatch sometime in the spring or the summer. And uh, the first stage that you'll come across is the larval stage. So the larval tick stage is um, the only stage that will have six legs. So if you find a six-legged tick, uh, six-legged tick, hmm, <laughs> words are really hard uh, at this time of the at this time of the day, apparently. So if you find a six-legged tick, uh, then you're probably safe because larval ticks typically don't have any pathogens or germs that can cause any diseases. And so larvae will typically feed on small mammals. So that includes white-footed mice. And those are the known reservoirs that can carry the Lyme disease pathogen inside them. So if any ticks feed on them, those ticks will then be infected. So uh, that larval tick will feed on that small mammal. That tick will fall off uh, once it's done feeding. It will overwinter into the uh, next year. So we're now in the second year. And uh, once the spring approaches, we'll have our nymphal ticks um, emerge. And so at this point, if the nymphal tick picked up a pathogen from the larval stage, then that stage will then be infected and can then transmit that pathogen to any hosts that they feed on. So nymphs are likely to feed on larger animals, but they can also feed on smaller animals as well. So they're not exactly picky when it comes to uh, their blood meals. So nymphs can feed on humans at, at this point. Um, and once they're done feeding, they will then fall off their hosts and then they will emerge in that following fall um, as adults. So adults will primarily feed on larger animals and um, including humans. And uh, during the fall, they will also find deer. And so deer are considered the reproductive hosts uh, for ticks. And so they provide that nice blood meal for, for the females, but the males will also find deer in order to mate with that female. So after that female is done feeding and she's done mating, she'll then drop off and she will go somewhere to hide uh, and over winter. And then she'll lay her eggs and then the eggs hatch. And that completes this whole circle of life uh, for the ticks. And so I also wanted to remind you that the nymphal stage is going to be the most dangerous stage because remember how small those nymphal ticks are. They're about the size of a poppy seed. So people often miss them, even though uh, both the nymphal and the adult stages can have uh, pathogens that can make you sick. So knowing the life cycle of ticks really plays a major role in, in tick control. So without understanding this whole two-year life cycle that ticks can have, it can be difficult for clients to know why ticks came to just keep, seem, uh, keep coming back uh, to their properties year after year. So um, not only do you have to worry about the adults that you're controlling now, but you also have to worry about the adults that may appear within the next year. So your control methods have to be planned and they also have to be uh, continual. Looking at the seasonal activity of the common ticks that I talked about, including the black-legged tick that transmits uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease. Our biggest risk for ticks happens to be between uh, May and September. So that pretty much spans um, the whole summer for here in Pennsylvania. And so we're approaching May pretty soon. So uh, make sure to watch out for ticks during uh, the next couple of months. So if you're looking to target a specific life stage of tick to control, it's really important to know when those stages will be the most active. So remember that if you take care of adults in your uh, first year of your control plan, make sure that you have control for adults in the next year as well. So depending on the tick species, um, you'll have different pathogens that are transmitted by each, each of these tick species, but more than one species of ticks can uh, transmit the same pathogens. So identification of ticks is also really important because some diseases are uniquely transmitted by some of these ticks. So if you ever find a tick attached, remove it, but also make sure to keep that tick and bring it to the doctor if you start experiencing any symptoms. That will actually really help uh, the doctor narrow down possible tick-borne diseases that you might have. 
Now, when we're talking about uh, symptoms, almost all of these diseases that you see listed here, they start out in a very similar way, and they often resemble a flu or a cold. So you have very general flu-like symptoms. You might have some muscle cramps and um, occasional headaches. Uh, but if it remains untreated, then more than likely that disease will progress to more life-threatening symptoms. So what's important here to know is that you should probably go to a doctor as soon as you can. Even if you don't think you've been bitten by a tick and you have an unseasonal flu going on, you might wanna go see a doctor. Getting early treatment is really key to survival and it will also lower your risk of having any permanent disabilities that are caused by these tick-borne diseases. So luckily a lot of these can be treated with antibiotics. Uh, really the only diseases that might not be able to be treated with antibiotics are Powassan virus, um, as well as uh, starry and the tick associated uh, meat allergy. So again, we see Exodes scapularis here again, our little black legged tick. Um, they're the most common ticks here in PA and Lyme disease is also the most common tick-borne disease that is transmitted in Pennsylvania as well. And so I will let Bill talk about this in more detail in his slides after my presentation. He has uh, great information about Lyme disease and the symptoms to look out for. So Lyme disease in particular has really expanded in range since the mid-1990s. Um, so I think some of you might be in near Philadelphia, so right around this area, and then kind of just spread out pretty much all throughout Pennsylvania. For the past decade or so, uh, Pennsylvania has reported the greatest number of Lyme disease cases, making this a really huge problem for the state. So in 2018, which was the last time I think the CDC reported um, the number of Lyme disease cases, uh, Pennsylvania was number one yet again, um, and they had, a, we, we reported about 10,000 cases, which is incredibly high. I think the next highest state was New Jersey, and they only had about, I think, 4,000 cases. So great reduction from first to second place. So obviously we know that ticks and tick-borne diseases are kind of a big deal in the area. So how do you protect yourself now? Uh, so let's think about where we might encounter ticks in the first place. And so when we think about the places where we find or where we might find ticks, you probably think of the woods or the forests, right? Well, you would probably be correct. The woods are the perfect place for ticks to be hiding. So whether you're hiking or you're hunting or just working in the woods in general, ticks will also be there. These areas include places that have high grasses or lots of brush or vegetative cover. Um, this also includes uh, places with lots of rock walls or log piles, since uh, these log piles can provide nice little locations and cozy little homes for the small mammals and the ticks that might be feeding on them. But you can also encounter ticks just outside your own home, whether you're doing housework or even on your farm. So if, especially if you live near wooded areas, um, some wild, wild animals can come into your yard, some ticks can fall off, and that's an opportunity for ticks to come in contact with you when you're in your yard. So in other words, like I said before, important point number one, uh, ticks are everywhere, just like I mentioned in one of the first slides. So if ticks are everywhere, how do you protect yourself from them? Well, there are a couple of ways. So I'll talk about personal protection methods first, and then we'll move into more landscape level uh, protection to uh, prevent ticks from getting into your yards. So a good way to think of personal tick prote uh, protection is that a good offense is really your best defense. Um, avoiding areas where ticks uh, may be more common, such as tall grasses and brush, that's a really good strategy to prevent coming in contact with ticks in the first place. Uh, but if you have to go into those areas, there are ways to protect yourself in those areas. So first is by wearing long layers. This will prevent ticks from coming in contact with your skin in the first place. Uh, I also recommend tucking in your pants into uh, your socks and then tucking your shirt into uh, your pants. And that will prevent ticks from uh, coming in contact with your skin in the first place. Um, I also recommend uh, wearing light colored clothing. Uh, that will help you uh, see any dark colored ticks on your on your light clothing, um, any ticks that may have hitched a ride while, while you're outdoors. I also recommend that you wear a DEET or a similar repellent that will keep ticks from finding you and biting you. We also suggest that you use a CDC recommended repellent on your skin, which I'll talk about um, in the next slide. Now you can also treat your clothes with permethrin. It comes in this yellow, bo uh, yellow bottle here. And once you treat your clothes, that should last for about six washes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides as well. So after you come uh, back indoors from the great outdoors, you should also do a tick check. And so we'll go over specific places to check during a tick check in a few slides. Uh, but the main thing to know is that these ticks really prefer dark and humid places on your body. So I'll let you think about that for a little bit um, to kind of think about dark and humid places on your body because that's where ticks are probably gonna look, uh, look for in terms of a new home. 
So we also recommend taking a shower after you come back from the outdoors. And not only will you be squeaky clean from coming back from the outdoors, uh, but you'll also wash off any ticks that may have gotten on you, but not yet attached, uh, not yet attached to you. Another important way to protect yourself from ticks is to actually throw your outdoors clothes uh, just straight into the dryer and put it on high heat right when you get home. Uh, the CDC recently published a study showing that even just 10 minutes on high heat will kill ticks that are present on your clothing um, since ticks require high moisture and humidity to survive. And so the high heat in the dryer will completely desiccate or dry out those ticks, um, essentially killing them. And so while your clothes are in the dryer, this would be a great time to jump to the shower um, and do your tick check. So like I mentioned, uh, repellents are great at keeping you hidden from ticks in the first place. And so what I recommend are these uh, CDC recommended repellents. And so these include uh, DEET, uh, picaridin, oil of lemon eucalyptus, and IR3535. So the EPA actually has a tool that can find uh, the repellent that works best for you and your lifestyle. So if you work in the woods uh, very often, they will probably recommend things like DEET, which can last um, more than 10 hours, depending on uh, the concentration. And so the good news is that Nucatone has been approved as a repellent as well. And I believe it smells like grapefruit as it's a uh, uh, extract of grapefruit. So if you enjoy that, and that's great, but uh, it's also great in that we'll have another option for a repellent on the market pretty soon. Uh, if you're forget, uh, forgetful uh, like me sometimes, and you sometimes just forget your, to apply your repellent, you can actually treat your clothes with permethrin. So permethrin is sold in these uh, yellow, uh, spray bottles in your local stores. And they are specifically used to treat your clothes. And once your clothes are dried after you've sprayed them, your clothes are pretty, are, are good for about six washes. And uh, what happens is the permethrin um, will kill the ticks if the ticks come in contact with your clothes. So I have a quick little video here on tick responses to treated uh, fabric. So the pant leg on the left um, is left untreated, but the pant leg on the right has been treated with permethrin. And so what you see, these tiny little dots are their ticks. Um, on the treated side, you can see ticks just falling off one by one uh, because they, they come in contact with that permethrin. So, um, so permethrin is another option if you keep forgetting your repellents like me sometimes. Uh, tick checks are also a really critical way to prevent ticks from uh, latching on long enough to transmit any pathogens. So the sooner you remove a tick, the less of a chance you have of having ticks or having pathogens uh, transmitted to you. So you wanna be sure to check areas that would provide ticks with any protection. These are basically places that are um, dark and moist on your body. Um, as remember, uh, these ticks require moisture to survive. So be sure to check places like your scalp, um, check under your underarms, uh, your groin is a really great place to look for, for ticks, and even your belly button. Uh, your belly button doesn't seem like a great place, but I've had friends who've had uh, ticks in their belly buttons before. So make sure to check there as well. If you have any dogs, um, especially ones that are outdoors a lot of the times, uh, you might wanna check in between their toes. Um, ticks really love to just get lodged in there. Uh, we also can find ticks uh, specifically under the legs as well as around the ears. Uh, so when removing a tick, it's really important to grab the tick with your forceps um, or your tweezers in this case, as close to the skin as possible. So I have a little demonstration. This is the first time I'm doing it. So I grab my tick from upstairs. Um, so I have a little tick doll here. So what you wanna do, so this is a tick that's been embedded with you or embedded in you. And so here are the tweezers. You wanna grab as close to the skin as possible where the mouth parts would be. And you wanna pull just straight out. You don't wanna twist it. You don't wanna bend it. I just pull it straight out. And so I do not ever grab the nose squeeze zone. There's a reason why I put the nose squeeze zone here. Don't grab the abdomen of the tick because that can actually stress out the tick and the tick will regurgitate its gut contents um, straight into your bloodstream. And the gut contents will contain those pathogens if they have any, if they have any pathogens, they would be in the guts. So if you squeeze the gut and they puke it up into your bloodstream, the pathogens will also go into your uh, bloodstream. So again, once you have that firm hold, uh, onto the tick with your tweezers. Just pull it straight out with your tweezers. Don't bend it and don't twist it out. Please also do not, don't burn, don't burn it off. That's not the best idea. Uh, Vaseline is also not a really great idea either. Um, just use a pair of tweezers and just pull them out. Uh, so we also recommend that you create your own tick removal kit whenever you want to venture outdoors so that you always have a way to remove ticks. So remember that the earlier that you remove a tick, uh, the less of a chance that you have of getting a tick-borne disease. So uh, some ticks require about 24 to 48 hours to, um, to actually transmit any pathogens to you. So if you remove it within that time frame, 
um, then you have a less chance, a lesser chance of getting a tick-borne uh, pathogen transmitted. So at the very least, your kits should include a fine point um, tweezers, a pair of fine point tweezers, um, and also things that can clean up any wounds that are left by uh, the tick's mouth parts. So this includes uh, alcohol swabs, and aseptic creams, as well as any bandages to, to uh, cover up those wounds. So in addition to personal protection, uh, I also recommend that you control for ticks at the landscape or the home level in order to protect your families from ticks that are found um, around your homes. To protect yourself at home, you can conduct uh, landscape management. Um, this can be divided into two major groups. So the first is um, eliminating uh, tick habitat, and then you can also eliminate host habitat as well. So this is mostly aimed at removing habitats of these small mammals like this, um, like this white-footed mouse here. Um, and so remember that uh, these small mammals can carry pathogens that can affect the ticks once the ticks are feeding on them. So there are many uh, landscape changes that you can make to prevent encounters with ticks in, in your yard. And the first option is to create what's called uh, these tick safe zones. So the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station uh, created this really helpful graphic that you see on the screen. And it illustrates how various strategies can be employed at the same time to create a tick safe zone. So these include establishing a border or a barrier between highly trafficked areas such as a swing set or your garden. Um, so creating this barrier between that and uh, more wooded areas um, around your home. So this can really help uh, keep ticks out of areas where you or your family or even your pets are probably gonna be more likely to be present. So remember that I told you that ticks have um, high moisture requirements in order to survive. And so this is why they're probably gonna be more likely to be found in locations that can retain that water or that humidity such as leaf litter or, or brush. So ticks um, tend to overwinter in the leaf litter. So that makes uh, cleaning up your leaves not just an annoying yearly task, but it's actually a really important step in cutting ticks uh, life cycles short. So remove brush piles, uh, managing your vegetation on your property, as well as mowing your lawn. Um, this can actually all reduce tick habitat as well. And um, as these habitats are the perfect places for ticks to, to thrive. So if you're going to mulch your yard, and I know some people like to mulch their yards, um, I recommend that you choose um, a drier mulch to reduce any humidity that's required uh, for ticks to survive. Some of you may also have pollinator gardens or you might just have really large properties. So some of these techniques, these landscape techniques might not be the best options and that's okay. Um, that's why I'm presenting many different uh, strategies today so that you can choose the ones that make the most sense for you um, as well as your family and, and your property. So you can also employ uh, personal protection strategies in addition to these landscape management techniques. So you can still venture into these areas, but still keep these areas a little bit more wild. So just limit you and your pets um, exposure in these areas, but also wear repellents and protective clothing if you do want to be um, in these landscapes. Uh, Eliminating and uh, minimizing host habitat can also reduce ticks in your yard. So remember that many ticks require small mammals during one or more of their life stages. So limiting the habitats that these small mammals like to nest in, such as um, these rock walls um, or these log piles here, that can limit the number of small mammals that you find on your properties um, and thereby potentially decreasing the number of ticks that are present and thereby limiting your exposure to ticks um, as well. So that we've covered a variety of different tick protection tools that you uh, now have in your own toolbox. Let's uh, quickly review what those are. So for personal protection, uh, you can utilize protective clothing as well as repellents, um, as well as doing tick checks and putting your clothes in the dryer on high heat. In terms of protection around your home, uh, make sure you remove any brush or leaf litter and reduce or remove any host habitats such as rock walls. Um, we didn't talk about this, uh, but you can also use host targeted controls like tick tubes. So it's kind of like these little, um, they kind of look like uh, little toilet paper rolls with uh, cotton soaked with permethrin. And so the small mammals will take the, the cotton, uh, the permethrin soaked cotton with them to their nests. And uh, basically they'll cover themselves with permethrin and kill any ticks that are on them. And uh, also treat any ticks that are in their nests uh, because the cotton has been covered in permethrin. You can also use carocides, um, both synthetic and natural. And so both of these are uh, great control tools as well. So before I end my presentation, I did wanna provide you with some resources and, um, and I'll be sure to put this information into the chat after, after my presentation. So 
So last summer, a PSU Extension hosted a tick webinar series. So if you want to learn more about ticks and tick prevention, uh, these webinars can be found on the PSU Extension website. And you can find these on the Extension website just by searching for tick series or tick webinars um, in the search box. And uh, this should pull up a variety of different uh, webinars that we've hosted. So if you have a tick and you want it identified, you can contact uh, Dr. Michael Scavarla here at Penn State. If you have a photo, you can email it to him or you can send the specimen uh, straight to him. And his address is here on the screen and I'll also put that in the chat. Um, and he'll get back to you with an identification as well as some information about that tick. So if you want your tick tested um, and you live in Pennsylvania, you can go to ticklab.org to learn more about their free testing service. However, if you're not a PA resident, you can still submit your ticks here, um, or I guess ticks to Tick Lab um, at East Stroudsburg University, and uh, they can also test your ticks, but for a fee if you're not a PA resident. All right, so that's pretty much it for me. Um, I want to thank you for tuning in to, um, into my talk. And if you have any questions, I can try and answer them now or I can answer them uh, later in the chat. Um, you're also welcome to send me an email with any more questions after this is over. And you're also welcome to follow me on, on Twitter. So um, thank you and thanks for listening. Thank you very much. That was, that was great. That was a lot of information packed in um, well, like 20 minutes there. That was impressive. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's a good thing it's being recorded. So you can just watch it over and over again to get all that information. <laughs> Thank you very much, Karen. Exactly. Um, while we go through questions here, Bill, if uh, you want to share your screen while we uh, start that out, uh, let you share that. You should be able to now. Um, so yeah, I really, well, one, I like your, uh, your picture at the end there. I go to bed every night and I'm just like, what's that? <laughs> It, uh, ghost tick almost every single time, but it never goes away if you work in this field. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that was funny. Um, and then the 10 minutes, I learned uh, the, the 10 minutes in the dryer, I had no idea. Um, that, yeah. That yeah, it's, it's pretty helpful. It works pretty well. Um, I also forgot to mention, don't wash your clothes before putting them into the dryer. Just throw them straight into the dryer, because if you put wet clothes into the dryer, that actually makes the dryer humid. So that defeats the purpose. <laughs> so just put every, just put it dry into the heater and then you can wash it on your normal cycle. If only I could put my, uh, my golden retrievers uh, fur coat in the dryer every day, that would be nice. That would be convenient, yes. I also yeah. have a very hairy dog and she picks up, she can pick up things as well. So <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> All right, so we have four questions here that I saw at the moment. Uh, the first one was from Jennifer Sherwood. She says, can deer tick nymphs be light colored? Uh, so sometimes they can, it depends. And sometimes the coloring isn't always super consistent, um, which makes it really frustrating. Uh, sometimes the American dog tick, for example, can be like, it has that white coloration on their backs, but sometimes they don't. Um, I don't, I think some of them can be light colored, but that's because they've been bleached by the sunlight or for some other reason. But yeah, sometimes they can be, but more often times I, I believe they are dark colored. Okay, thank you. Um, we have our next question here. It is from Molly. She says, I missed the item that smelled like grapefruit. I missed ah. it. I remember, but I can't. Yeah, what was let that? me pick that. I can, it's called Nucatone. Nucatone. So I'll put it in the chat um, so that you can see the actual word. It's really hard to like say it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question was, are squirrels host for ticks? That was from Charlie. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Uh, so squirrels actually can serve as hosts uh, for ticks. Uh, we don't trap any squirrels during our surveillance program just because squirrels don't fit into our traps, they're way too big. Um, but yeah, they actually can carry ticks. I don't think it's as often um, as what we find on, on mice and other small mammals that are more semi-arboreal on the ground. Thank you. Uh, and then the next question goes off of that as well. Um, how about moles? Are they hosts for ticks? Ah, moles. You know, that's a really good question. I don't think I've, I don't, I'm not really sure, actually. Um, I was thinking of shrews, but it, those are not moles. Uh, I don't think they're very common hosts uh, for ticks. They might be for, um, for other species of exodes that are not important in the whole Lyme disease cycle. Um, but exodia scapularis, the one that transmits uh, Lyme disease, uh, probably not, not very common. Okay. Also interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that either. Um, our next question, uh, I, I was waiting for something like this to come up from our crowd. Our crowd is a very like, oh, we native species. If it's supposed to be here, it's supposed to be here. And we're all about doing the best in our yard for 
you know, wildlife and things like that. Um, so this question, I, I kind of saw this coming. This is from Krista, very good question. She <laughs> says, leaf litter is really important for other native insect species and provide winter cover for snakes. So removing, removing leaves has its downside, yes? Yeah, so that's a question that's come up before. Um, and my only answer to that is that it's true. Like leaf litter is incredibly important for um, insects as well as um, snakes. So you don't have to completely remove leaves from your yard. I just recommend maybe leaving some areas with leaves so that you have like a little home for those uh, for the snakes and those insect species that require that leaf litter. Just put it in a certain area of your yard and just don't travel to that area as often. Or if you wanna leave leaves in your yard, that's okay too. Just make sure to do your tick checks and do your personal protection uh, strategies as well. So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah th thank you for that answer. I mean, everyone is to each his own. I mean, you know, not everyone can, you know, is comfortable with having all that in your yard and they like, you know, some, some to be wild, some not, you know, we can't convince everyone to make their whole, um, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Doug Tallamy. me. We, we can't get everybody to do that. Yeah, but, exactly. <laughs> As long as everyone does their part, I mean, you're joining this web during the night, so you must care at least a little bit. So that's good. But we understand everyone's angles from this. It makes sense for everybody to do what's best for them. Exactly. Uh, next question. What impacts tick population numbers? No, oh, very good question. That's a really loaded question. Because <laughs> um, there are a lot of factors. Uh, weather is a huge part of it. Um, if it's too cold, well, actually, weather might not be as big of a factor. And, I won't go into that right now, uh, but really it's um, probably the hosts that are available, which are also, I guess, affected by weather. So if you have a lot of mice in your yard, you're gonna have a lot of ticks in your yard as well. And same with deer. So deer carry the adult ticks and they, like I said, they serve as the reproductive hosts. So they don't, the deer don't, you know, do anything in terms of pass, pass any pathogens to ticks. I take that back. They do for some pathogens, <laughs> but not for Lyme disease. Um, they don't really do anything with Borrelia, uh, but they do carry ticks on them. And so if the ticks are done feeding, they can just drop off anywhere that they want and it could be your yard. So if you have yards that allow deer and mice to kind of frolic uh, together or to uh, just run around in your yard, uh, you'll probably have more ticks in those areas. It's, it's, it's a lot of it is based on host presence uh, as well as climatic factors or other ecological factors. Thank you. Um, and then we have another question here about um, skin repellents and things like that. I think she said she was going to put some of those into the chat. Um, is that okay? Yeah, I think those in the chat. Absolutely. Perfect. I think that'd be best for everybody. Um, and then Deborah Kessler, she's the one who um, suggested you guys tonight. Uh, she, she's kind of disappointed that you didn't remember her lint roller suggestion. Ah, dang it. She was the one who recommended the lint roller, wasn't she? I do she remember was. the lint roller. When I saw that comment just now, I just went, oh, she recommended that. And I've I was gonna put the relent roller, but I didn't have space in my slide. I promise. <laughs> um, but yeah, lint rollers are really great to bring with you as well. Um, just lint roll it all over your clothes, and it should pick up any ticks that you may that may have uh, that may have gotten on your clothes. And Deborah's one of our volunteers, so she gets literally head deep in the the vines here. So you know she she knows her techniques. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah. Um, I think we have more questions here, but we'll save those till the end, just so we can get on um, get on to um, Bill. Um, so again, Bill uh, Bill Moore is the from Pittsburgh Lyme Disease Support Group, um, and he's the head of the not maybe that uh, I got my head titles wrong here, but he's with the PA Lyme Resource Network. Um, take it away, Bill. Thank you, and thank you, Karen, for the questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I am Bill Moore, and I'm with. Uh, an all volunteer group called the PA Lyme Resource Network. And we have support groups all across Pennsylvania. I think we have 18 support groups now across Pennsylvania, uh, providing education and support for people affected by Lyme disease. And I normally, um, we have a program called the Dare to be Tick Aware program. It's, uh, which I'm doing a part of that program tonight. Karen covered the first part and I'm gonna cover uh, the second part of that program tonight. Okay, so just a quick medical disclaimer. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a volunteer and a guy that uh, had Lyme disease. So um, anything you hear that might sound like uh, medical advice, I'm not giving you any medical advice. I would refer you to uh, a doctor or a medical professional if you need any uh, 
medical advice. So we're gonna talk about um, how to eliminate ticks correctly. I know Karen covered that a little bit. We're gonna talk about it just for another minute. So you've done everything you can. You follow all of Karen's advice and you've put your repellents on, you've landscaped your yard properly, you've done, um, you put your clothes in the dryer, you, you, you took a shower, did a tick check, but still you got bit by a tick. So what do you do? You, you wanna eliminate the tick correctly. So I'll uh, agree with everything that Karen said and um, repeat it just for a minute. You wanna grab, and Karen, I need that stuff tick. I need that as a prop for my next, uh, my next presentation. So we'll talk about that. But anyway, you do wanna grab that tick nice and low near its mouth parts. Um, as low as you can, you wanna pull it out firmly, but do not squeeze that tick. Because as Karen put it, squeezing the tick will will cause whatever he has in his gut, which, you know, there's a probably a 50% chance that his gut has some sort of pathogen in it, um, is going to get pushed back into you. And you want to you want to grab it um, firmly, pull it out as quick as you can without agitating him. You do not want to agitate the tick. Uh, agitating the tick will cause him to regurgitate whatever um, pathogens he has back into you. So do not twist the tick, that could agitate him. Do not burn the tick, that could really agitate him. Uh, don't squeeze the body. Uh, don't use, fill in the blank, don't use it. Don't put anything on the tick. Just don't use petroleum jelly. Don't use, have you had people ask me about essential oils? I'll say no, don't do it. So here are some good, uh, tick removal tools that have been studied. Uh, thin point tweezers are just fine. They're, they they make a very good uh, tick removal tool. There are some uh, pretty interesting tick removal tools you might want to consider. Uh, the ones we're showing here are available on Amazon. Pro Tick Remedy is kind of neat because it's got that little slot and scoop. Uh, and I've never pulled uh, a tick off of a dog, but I'm told this works really good for dogs. Uh, you just want to scoop under that tick. Uh, and and you'll get him right on his mouth parts. It's just the right size and pull him out. Why does my slide keep going forward? <laughs> um, and then the tick check card is also a pretty good thing you could you could have. It's also got that slot where you could get under the tick and pull him out and a uh, magnifying glass. So what do you do with the tick? Uh, we recommend against flushing it down the toilet. Uh, Ticks do not have lungs, they do not drown. They will not drown in the washer. They will not drown in the toilet. Uh, they may come back from the toilet and you would not want that. Uh, do not burn the tick. Uh, if discarding it, just put it, put it in something sealed and throw it away so that it can't come back out to bother you again. Uh, but we do recommend do not dispose of the tick. Um, keep it in a uh, plastic sealable bag uh, with a moist cotton ball, save it. Uh, as Karen mentioned, ticklab.org, tick testing is free. The basic panel was free in the state of Pennsylvania. So, um, and I'll also put a plug for tick testing in that tick testing is 99.9% accurate as far as figuring out if the tick had a pathogen or not. Uh, testing, Lyme disease testing on a person is much, much less accurate than that. Uh, so do not, uh, I, I like tick testing better than actual um, uh, testing a person for Lyme disease. Not, not that I'm saying you shouldn't get tested for Lyme disease. I'm not saying that. The tick testing is much more accurate. Okay, so if symptoms arise. Well, I've already put the plug for uh, uh, ticklab.org here, but their basic panel has um, Lyme disease, anisplasmosis, babesiosis, uh, Kwasin virus. Uh, if you want to add um, Bartonella uh, to the testing, it's available for another $50. And um, yeah, just a real good idea to do the tick testing. So what do you do with the tick test report? Uh, keep the report provided to your doctor. Just, uh, just because the tick had a, 
out a pathogen and he tests positive for a pathogen, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to contract that disease like he had. Borrelia, burgdorferi doesn't mean you're going to get Lyme disease, but it's good to know. It's really good to know. Um, make sure you're aware of the symptoms tied to a positive result. So if you if that tick tested positive for Borrelia, burgdorferi, and you're starting to exhibit symptoms of Lyme disease, well, that's a pretty good sign that uh, you've got Lyme disease. If you become symptomatic, positive results should be discussed uh, with your physician. Uh, and a negative tick test does not rule out disease, nor does a positive test indicate that you've been infected, although it's, it's you know, it's statistically likely. Catching the disease early. There, there's nothing more important than that. The one with the the best thing is to never get bit. But the next best thing, I really apologize. I'm having computer problems tonight. My slides uh, keep advancing on their own. Um, the, the most important thing is to catch it early. Um, if you catch Lyme disease early, you have a very, very, very strong chance of completely um, recovering from Lyme disease. If you let it linger for months or, worst case, even years, uh, you you have a much better chance of catching something that's uh, debilitating, uh, symptoms that will debilitate you and disable you, and, and you certainly wouldn't want that. So what are the symptoms of Lyme disease? Uh, early on, you're going to get uh, flu-like symptoms. Uh, and, yeah, you're going to get flu-like symptoms. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me let me show you this slide first. Uh, you're going to get flu-like symptoms. You there's a good chance you're going to get what's called the bullseye rash or the uh, erythema migrans rash, uh, and it's it oftentimes looks like a round red bullseye. Hence, it's called the bull, the bullseye rash. But you can get Lyme disease and not have a bullseye rash, so um, don't get hung up with the rash either. But those are flu, and that rash is uh, the early symptoms. Early disseminated, as it begins to spread a little bit, uh, you're going to see headaches, fatigue, uh, sleep problems, joint pain. Uh, this this person in the lower right here has Bell's palsy. That's a partial paralysis of the face. That's a pretty good, pretty good sign. You got Lyme disease if you get that symptom. And then late disseminated, if you allow it uh, to go untreated. That's when Lyme disease really gets serious with arthritis, fatigue, uh, cognitive problems, mental problems, uh, and heart-related problems, cardiac complications. Um, yeah, okay. So the bullseye rash. Um, there's about a 50% chance that you'll get that bullseye rash. But if you do get it, it's almost 100% chance that you have Lyme disease if you see it. So the classic bullseye rash looks like that rash in the upper left there. It's got the, the red circles, looks like a bullseye. But the bullseye rash or other rashes that you can get can vary widely. So you can get other rashes uh, that look like what you're seeing in this picture. Uh, they're not always circular. Uh, sometimes there's multiple rashes in different spots on your body. They may be irregular. Uh, they may be painful, they may be itchy, they may be raised, they may be flat. They're very, um, uh, it's not very consistent, right? Okay, so, be, so if you get any kind of rash like this, please consider that it's likely Lyme disease. Okay, co-infection prevalence. So ticks, we like to say the ticks are nature's dirty needles because they don't just carry Lyme disease. They can have you know, Bartonella, Babesiosis, Colossal uh, uh, virus, Colossal virus, luckily it's pretty rare, but a lot of different things um, a tick can have. So it's important that when you're going to seek medical advice that you ask your doctor, okay, I was bit by a tick, please test me for Lyme disease. Would you also consider testing me for Bartonella, Babesia, or Lichiosis? Uh, because you can see from the percentages here, 53% of the patients with persistent symptoms reported also not only having Lyme disease, but having some other co-infection. So it's important to find the right doctor, someone that's 
educated enough to say, yeah, let's test you for Lyme disease and we'll also test you for some of these other infections. And the more infections you have, it only stands to reason is the sicker you're going to get from that tick bite. So if that tick only had Lyme disease, you only caught Lyme, I don't wanna say it's, it's a minor thing, but if that tick had Lyme disease and Babes Babesia and Bart Bartonella, they're gonna be much sicker from that. Uh, here's what a, a Bartonella rash looks like on the left here, uh, also known as a cat scratch fever. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever uh, on the lower right there has a very distinctive look. And why is this important? I've already said this. Uh, different infections require different tests. Uh, different infections may require different treatments, although a lot of these things are treated by antibiotics. It might be a different kind of antibiotic. Treating only Lyme may result in persistent symptoms if you don't catch the other infection. Uh, so just please keep it in mind. And see your doctor. If you got bit by a tick and you start having the symptoms that I've um, mentioned, please go see a doctor. Please get treatment. Please take care of it early. Take care of it early. Very good chance you're going to put it behind you and fully recover. If you let it fester, you may not be so lucky. So see your doctor if you have new onset symptoms after a tick bite. Uh, remember the 50% rule, 50%. Don't even recall getting bit by a tick. Remember those little uh, things that we thought were poppy seeds and they were really ticks on that muffin. Uh, those things are tiny. You might miss them. Okay, if you get bit by a nymph tick, you may not, you may not catch it. So 50% of the people that get Lyme disease don't recall being bit by a tick. 50% do not recall a rash. But if you start getting those symptoms, please seek medical advice. So in summary, you can prevent Lyme disease. It's easy to prevent. If you take what I'll call, you know, sensible, uh, sensible uh, um, precautions like Karen had mentioned tonight. Uh, the vast majority of bites occur in your own yard. Your yard can be a terrible place for ticks, especially if it abuts uh, the woods. Uh, Tick-borne diseases can have serious consequences if you catch it early, not so much. But if you don't catch it early, it can be a life-changing illness. Uh, children are at high risk. Why? Because children are outside playing. They're, 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 they love to run through the, the woods and the muck right there. So they're, they're at high risk. Uh, and please visit our website, www.palon.org, uh, not only for uh, emerging science, as, uh, as the slide says, but also if you, if you know somebody or if you yourself need um, help with Lyme disease, uh, we're here for you. So to wrap up, uh, you also find this on our website. We have all these pamphlets that you can download for free. Uh, this presentation, which I only gave part of it, uh, uh, there's dozens of us that will give this presentation for free if, uh, if you need, if you know of a group that needs this presentation. So we have all these brochures on our website. We have the tick ID card on our website. Uh, we have these um, school resources, uh, a school nurse poster, and um, field trip info. Well, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of times you send your kid to school, they're good, they go on a field trip or something like that, a place that has text, and you don't know anything about it. So it, we're trying to encourage schools to get involved with, you know, informing the kid, informing the parents where the kids are going on these field trips. And by all means, if a if a if a, if a child gets bit by a tick at school or on a or on a field trip. You know, the parents want to know about that. Here's a quick slide with uh, resources. Uh, our website, palime.org, uh, Lyme disease information from the PA Department of Health. Um, tick Encounter Resource Center out of Rhode Island, a wonderful, wonderful website uh, for ticks uh, to, to learn about the uh, tick prevention and so on. The tick testing and so forth is on here. So we are the Peony Lyme Resource Network. Uh, every little flag there is a support group that we have in Pennsylvania. Uh, we need some representation up in the area, area it, it appears. Um, Tick Encounter.org, I reflect them. So thank you, appreciate it. Uh, and I'll answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Bill. That was a, a lot of information. And I think it ended on a, a happy, a happy note that yes, ticks are, 
can be very scary. Um, but if you're prepared and you're smart about it, I, almost no problem. But I mean, there's tiny little ones that can get you. But as long as you do your part in being prepared, um, you can keep yourself pretty safe. And um, you provided a lot of resources here for everybody. So thank you for that. Um, if you have questions for Bill or um, Karen, please type them in the chat now. But I'm going back to Jeff Clark. I think that was the last question we left off at. And um, I believe it was for um, Dr. Dr. Poe. Please clarify if it is the nymph stage of the tick that attaches itself to you versus the adult stage tick. Uh, so it's actually both. Uh, both of those life stages um, are pretty likely to, to feed on you. So the nymphal ticks, they aren't really picky in terms of what they eat. They can feed on small animals, but they can also feed on larger animals um, like humans. Um, adults typically choose larger animals. So that includes us. We are large animals. And so um, adults are, are also likely to feed on us. Larvae, not so much. Those are the six-legged stage uh, ticks. They are not super likely to feed on us, but they can. Okay. I have a private message here that says, um, which stage is most likely, or which stage can they start transmitting diseases? Uh, so the nymphal stage can start transmitting uh, those diseases. Uh, the, at least the most common ones that I listed um, on the screen. So Watson virus is still being researched. We don't know how early that one can be uh, transmitted yet. Uh, but I do know that Borrelia miyamotoi, which is a relative of Borrelia burgdorferi, which does cause Lyme disease, that one actually can be transmitted at the larval stage. So it can go from mother to offspring. Uh, but that one's an extremely rare uh, Borrelia strain. So don't worry too much about it. Um, and again, you're not likely, you're not super likely to run into Exodes um, tick larvae. Or just avoid very brushy areas. That's a really great way to avoid larval ticks. Thank you. Um, Deborah Kessler says, would you suggest using a lint roller before putting uh, clothes in the dryer? Uh, yeah, so I don't see why you, uh, yeah, you could totally do both. Um, I'm trying to think if you should use it after, but the ticks might have already, might have already fallen off um, if they get caught in your lint, your, uh, your lint trapper. Um, so yeah, you can do it before or after. I think most of the ticks that have died in the dryer will probably not be on your clothes anymore. So probably before would be, would be better. And then putting it into the dryer uh, would just add that extra bit of um, security as well. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and then um, Karen put all the um, suggestions for uh, repellents in the chat. That's what's next. And then uh, Scott contact information. And then a website. So that's all here in the chat. Um, at the end, I'll show you all how to save the chat if you don't know how to do that. So you don't have to worry about getting all this information just this moment. Uh, Christine Bruce says you can discard it uh, sealed in scotch tape as for discarding it, I think referring to Bill's um, section. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that would work. Can't see why not. Thank you, Christine. Uh, and then we have Vince. Question. How accurate is the timing of tick attachment from tick labs? Also, how long does a tick need to be attached to transmit disease? I think that's for Bill. Well, I'd love to answer that question. Um, so I have a, I have a, um, I have a slide that I didn't show because this was a abbreviated presentation. I wish I could bring it up now, but I can't. Um, but it basically shows that um, in the early stages of attachment, the percentage of the, the probability of um, uh, transmitting a disease is pretty low, but there's always some risk. So I don't, so you might say after it's attached for 24 hours, the 48 hours, well, that, that there's a pretty good chance it's that you're going to contract a disease. However, even if it's been less than 24 hours, I would say two things. One, you might not know exactly when that tick attached. You're probably just guessing, right? You, you might not know exactly. Second, there's always some risk, right? Even if it's been less than 24 hours, there's always, it's a smaller risk, but there's always some risk that it did transmit a disease. So there's always some risk. I guess that's that's the way I would answer that. Good. Thank you for the honest answer, Bill. Um, Deborah Kessler uh, says, question for Bill. In the 90s, the physicians I knew were not very skilled at diagnosing a symptom of tick bites. Would he know if any studies or surveys have been done since then to find out if physicians are more aware? 
does he know if there are any physician, physician assistant continuing education credits offered in diagnosing the multiple diseases caused by ticks? Well, a lot of question there. Well, let me think how I can answer that. Uh, <laughs> I, I can only give you my, um, my layman's opinion. Uh, I don't feel that the doctors have gotten any better, uh, maybe may be up a tad <laughs> at, at picking up the symptoms of Lyme disease. Um, now, part of, um, part of what we do at PA Lyme is we have a doctor referral uh, service. So if you come to our website, you can find that. If you need uh, a referral to someone in your area that, in our opinion, is um, more skilled at, at treating Lyme disease, we'll, we'll give you that. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I don't know why, but no, it doesn't seem to have gotten much better from the 90s. I don't have any studies to prove or disprove that. Um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Lyme brain, I've already forgot. Uh, if you know of any um, continuing, edu continuing education credit courses that are available for physicians or physician assistants about yeah, this time. So there's, there's, there's an organization called ILADS, and they put on um, medical conferences. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure they're all virtual these days. Um, and PALIM.org, we actually do, or we did until COVID hit, unfortunately, we do a medical conference once a year uh, in partnership with ILADS, and it was normally in the Philadelphia area, uh, and it was for continuing education credits, uh, and it was all about, you know, the treatment and the, and the latest research on, on Lyme disease. Unfortunately, yeah, that's another thing that suffered because of COVID. I hope it comes back uh, really soon, but uh, check out our website, palime.org or ILADS website uh, for information about um, and ILADS may have continued their education uh, through um, Zoom or virtual methods. I'm not sure. Thanks, Bill. Uh, it seems like there's, there's a lot more resources than I thought there were. Um, that's really awesome, and, and it's it's important. Um, we have three more questions I hear, and then I think we're going to wrap up, um, unless anyone else has pressing questions. Um, but I'm going to try and answer these three just for sake of everyone's time. If you have more questions after that, just email them to me and I'll get them, uh, those answers to you. Uh, but next question, do you recommend spraying the yard for ticks? Big question here. Yes, to a certain extent. Um, make sure you read the label. Uh, it's really important that you follow those labels um, and make sure that you check if it's a concentrated, uh, re not repellent, a concentrated a caricide. Um, and also make sure to read like, what does it actually kill? Because ticks are not insects. So if you use an, an insecticide, it might be able to work against the ticks, but not always. The ticks are not insects, remember that. <laughs> um, I also recommend maybe checking with a, um, with a pest control, a professional pest control, um, official pest control management service <laughs> is what you might wanna call them uh, because they might have more knowledge about how to apply it and where to apply those specifically. Um, so yeah. Um, may, may I add to that? Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I would say normally the advice we give is as long as your yard is not overgrown and, and, and overrun with leaf litter, you only need to spray the perimeter of your yard where that barrier be between your yard and the woods might be. Because if your yard is already cut short and your grass is cut short and you don't have a lot of uh, litter, uh, the sunshine is going to kill the ticks. They don't. They don't want to venture out into an area where they're going to be exposed to the sun and dry out. They love that moisture, right? So they're. So that that's the advice we give. Yeah. And my advice is, please check with your neighbor before you do any sort of spraying in your yard. Um, whether they have a garden, whether they have tick, uh, not ticks, dogs or children, please check with your neighbors. Yes, it is your yard, but just be respectful and please check with your neighbors before doing any type of spraying, like I said, do each your own. Your neighbors may not approve of that and you could come to some sort of agreement, but please check with your neighbors. Um, is it possible that chipmunks are also carriers of ticks, um, known for adult stage? So yes, so we would trap chipmunks in our traps sometimes and they are, and I believe chipmunks are actually considered reservoirs as well, um, just like the white footed mice, but they're not exactly the greatest reservoirs for, for uh, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. Um, for nymphs or adult stage, I believe they're mostly 
I would say probably nymphal stages and probably the larval stage, probably not the adult stages. So adults are mostly reserved or they mostly like others, larger animals because they are a little bit bigger. So they need a larger host in order to feed on them. I, I don't have the number in front of me, Karen, but they are less likely mm -hmm. to transcribe disease from chipmunk to tick than like a white-footed mouse where it's yeah. very, very good chance they're going to transmit to a tick. Mm -hmm. So Interesting. Interesting. Well, <laughs> I've learned so much already. And a lot of myths I've had have also been busted. So thank you guys. And uh, here's our last question. Um, and then we'll have closing remarks and some comments. But last question from Molly here. My daughter will be at Core Creek Park under Pavilion for six hours every day, Sunday, for her youth orchestra rehearsal. What can she do to protect from tick bites? Hmm. Good question. Um, I guess it's a, uh, definitely wear long pants if she can and also tuck those pants into the sock. Um, if she's walking around in like areas that have a lot of leaf litter or really overgrown grass or if they're in the woods playing or not playing, uh, playing their instruments <laughs> during rehearsal, uh, that, that would be very odd and I hope she's not doing that. Um, but yeah, I, I'm assuming that if she's going to be in a pavilion um, and it's neat and grass is cut and everything, she should be pretty safe. But I also recommend wearing, wearing repellent um, as well. So I did put a link to the EPA website that has a lot of options for different types of repellents that fit, you know, certain lifestyles. Um, so go ahead and check that out just to see what repellent might work best for her. So, um, and also just do your tick checks when you get home, um, take a shower when you get home and uh, put her clothes into the dryer right away. Did you have anything to add to that, Bill? No, that sounds pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I think you covered it there. Um, uh, would either of you like to make any kind of closing remarks um, or anything like that? Uh, this was great. Uh, I appreciate the the invite to to give a presentation. It's been a while since I gave these outreach presentations, so it was really nice to get back into it. So thank you for the invitation. Ditto, Hope ditto. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully, you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, um, I sh I can put my or I guess Kevin has my email address. So if you have any questions, feel free to forward any questions to him. Yeah, so if you got the Zoom link tonight, uh, it's a good chance you got it from my email. Uh, we learned better than just putting the Zoom link correct, directly on our website. Um, that will no longer happen uh, for uh, other reasons. But uh, so if you did get to the Zoom link, you got it from me tonight. If not, just reach out to the Penny Pack. Um, we'll get you any questions answered or get you in touch with our presenters tonight. Um, so on behalf of the members of the Penny Pack Trust, thank you guys for tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. It's nice to get some of these, some, some real truth to a lot of these topics that go floating around the internet. Um, so thank you for your research and thank you guys for the work you do. And thank you for doing this program for us tonight. Um, to close, um, again, Kevin Roth from the Penny Pack Trust. Our next program is actually also on ticks. And we're gonna dive into some more of the research end of it. This, this is kind of more of an overview um, like you saw tonight. Next week, we're gonna dive into alpha-gal syndrome, which is a newer um, disease that is coming from ticks, but we're also gonna, like I said, dive into it and learn the truth about it. Um, so I put the link for that. You can register for that um, right now if you'd like. Uh, just click that link and go register. That program is also free, but also, like I said, um, all of our work is supported by members. So if you like the program tonight, wish to see more like it, or if you just enjoy our 850 acres of beautiful nature preserve, Please make a donation tonight or become a member and all of our in-person, pro most of our in-person programs are free for members. So uh, becoming a member is the best thing you can do to support the Penny Pack Trust. Um, and you can look into the organizations that present it tonight and see how you can support them as well. Um, I think that's all the information I have. I hope to see a lot of you at our future events. And um, thank you again, Dr. Karen Poe and Bill Moore for presenting tonight. Um, thank you and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank uh, you. There were just asked about how.